another thing I do with the books is I try to imagine the poet writing the poems and just where they are, I don't know where they are, you know, but I try to imagine some space where they might be working, whether it's some kind of private space or a public space or whether they're writing to a notebook. And with Jane Clark, and I may well be completely wrong, I imagine her actually in the open air, in some kind of park, in some kind of maybe wooded area in that park, and she's got a notebook, a big notebook with no lines in it, and she's starting, and the poems are moving across the page, as they often do in early drafts of poems. So there are words here, words there, and they gradually coalesce into a poem. I may be wrong, but that just helps me to think about how Jane writes her poems. The other thing I think about a lot when I'm thinking about the books is just the title. Titles of books and titles of poems, as we know, can often be another line, another free gift. And Jane Clark's book is called A Change in the Air. And you think, yeah, that is not only a great metaphor for what poetry is, it changes the air around us, but also it's a great metaphor for what this book is. It does, it changes the air. There's a lot of air-changing poems in this book of many kinds, many different forms, but what I think Jane Clark does particularly well is the couplet. She lives so beautifully in the land of the couplet and enlivens it and makes it dance and makes it sing and makes it move through this air, changing it. Maybe that's why I do imagine her sitting outside writing these poems and that somehow around her she can make these couplets and the other forms she uses uh, change the air around her. So, Jane Clark. Thanks very much, Ian, and uh, it's a pleasure and a great honour to be here this evening. Dressing my mother for her grandson's wedding. A darker shade of blue than her eyes. The dress has slept for years in the wardrobe, next to the clothes she won't let me give away. She raises her arms for me though she's forgotten why she can't stay by the fire with her collie. A new pair of tights, an old pair of shoes, softened at the toes and heels. She winces at the touch of the hairbrush. No sign of her pearls. I dredge through photos and medicines on top of the chest of drawers find them coiled around her engagement ring. She chooses a scarf, red as her lipstick. I tell her there is a beautiful woman in the mirror. She laughs. I might find a new man at the wedding. And then, in a whisper, sorry, Charlie, as if he's with us in their bedroom, listening. Um, a former miner in the lead mines in County Wicklow inspired this poem. Uh, he told me that he dreaded the work underground and it was only the company of the other miners and the pit ponies that made it bearable. Pit ponies of Glandassen. Hitched to an eight hour shift in britchens, hames, and traces. They follow the miners' carbide lights, halt under hoppers, turn on a thruppence, and lean into their collars to pull the five-wagon train. Low-set cobs from the curra, a piebald and two greys. Their hooves fall heavy as hammers on granite. They haul lengths of larch for pit props, pneumatic drills, boxes of gelignite, and 
from time to time deliver injured men back to daylight. The miners pat their necks in passing and feed them windfall apples, comrades in toil and first to stall, legs locked at a sudden rumbling, a change in the air or the rush of running water. So in answer to Ian's uh, question, a lot of these poems are written outside and definitely the inspiration for lots of them comes outside. This was, uh, I was on Ackle Island off the west coast of Ireland <coughs> walking uh, and met a fisherman who told me about working in the basking shark fishery when he was young. And I wanted to read this poem tonight because it's a story of near extinction and restoration. And what ecologists are telling us all over the world is that if we just give nature a chance, it does revive. At Perching Harbour, basking sharks, docile as seal pups, harpooned and netted from currucks, were towed one by one to the fishery at the slipway. Fathers and sons sliced off dorsal fins and hacked through blubber to reach oil-filled livers. Sweating in burnhouse heat, they shoveled bleeding flesh into the rendering machine. They couldn't wash the smell from their skin, not if they swam to Inish Galvan at the end of every shift. Year by year, the catch diminished, disappeared. But late last April, old men cheered from the headland and said, it's as if we've been forgiven. A school of 12 cruised into Keem Bay, moon tails swishing, fins proud as yawl sails above the waves. The title of this poem comes from the Irish word spolly, uh, for the small stones that hold a dry stone wall together. Spalls. To help us grow a garden, my mother and father travelled across the Bog of Allen and over the Wicklow Gap. They'd have preferred to drive west to Galway or Mayo, They'd have preferred a husband and children, but their daughter loved a woman. We'd have the table set for breakfast, rashers, black pudding, fried bread and eggs. When the soil had warmed, we unloaded shovels and rakes, buckets of compost and the rusted iron bar for prizing out rocks. The back seat was thronged with pots of seedlings my mother had nurtured all winter. We worked to her bidding, loosened tangled roots before planting, sow marigolds next to beans, sprinkle Epsom salts around roses. My father took off on his own to spud ragwort or clip a hedge. One day, he spent hours gathering stones of different shapes and sizes. By evening, he'd built us a wall under the holly, held together by gravity and friction, hearted with handfuls of spalls. Um, during lockdown, uh, one of our neighbours in the Wicklow Uplands died, and this poem is for him. Shepherd. 
When he was a boy, these upland fields grew more gorse and rushes than grass. He dug up rocks, shifted stones to ditches and laneways, plowed hummocks into the ground, harrowed furrows, seeded tilth. We'd meet him on our way up Kiriki, crouch to a ewe on her rump, he'd be clearing thorns from sore hooves before trimming. He'd pause to lament harsh weather or laugh at lambs nudging each other from hillocks. Was it last year we first saw him sit for a breath, his collie resting her head on his knee? On a midwinter morning, neighbours line the length of road downhill to the church at Ballinatone. Ewes huddled close in lambing sheds and through the five-bar gate to the yard an easterly wind keens silver. And I'd like to finish my reading this evening with a love poem. June. Because wild rose fills the garden to the sultry scented brim, and hawk moths flock to fuchsia, humming a wordless hymn. Because pipistrels flicker past heartbeats on the wing, and tonight's the eve of your birthday, the air warm as your skin. Because it's bright till almost midnight and the days will be sure too soon. Let's stay out here and listen for the wood pigeon's five note tune. Thank you very much. Thank you.